Okay, so the beautiful thing about having all of these uh, fancy technology things all scripted is that they start and stop automatically. The downside to that is they start and stop automatically, so I can't start until it starts. Now it told me to start, so now, now we're going to start. Uh, who here runs Linux on the desktop? Wow. <laughs> I asked that question in Redmond, Washington, and I got a very different response. Um, to me... Free and open source software, and the advantage of free and source software comes down to one critical idea, and that critical idea is maximum absence of coercion. And some people, I think, aren't even necessarily aware of what drives them to Linux. But I find a lot of people, when I talk to them, and I start having conversations of, why did you get to use Linux, and what did you start with? I find that rebel spirit, right? I wanted to break something. I wanted to, I took my mother's vacuum cleaner apart and it broke and then I couldn't put it get back together and she got really upset and that was an exhilarating experience and I've been trying to recreate that ever since, right? <laughs> like, there's that hacker thing inside of us that's like, I want to know more and I want to put my hands on the levers and I can't do that with Windows or Mac OS or Android or Chrome OS or whatever other operating system is out there. The reason I start with this is because the rest of the presentation I'm going to talk about a couple of things, and I want to make my position where I'm coming from a little bit more clear. I don't believe in forcing anybody to do anything they don't want to do. So 99.95%, I think that guy right over there said he didn't use Linux on the desktop, but everybody else in the room was like, yeah, I use Linux on the desktop. If that wasn't the case, you and I can still be friends. If you think Mac OS or if you think Windows is a better alternative, by all means, use it. And so that's the premise that I'm starting from, is I think we have to recognize that one of the biggest advantages that we have as Linux people is that we have choice. You have choice of your desktop environment. You have choice over the distro itself. You have choice over the hardware in which you can install your distro. All of those things give you choice. And that absence from being forced to do something is what keeps us here. Along with that, though, and along with not wanting to ever force anybody to use any particular tool that they don't think they want to use, I don't accept the excuse that I can't use Linux. I say that because I, ha as an IT consultant, I have had the opportunity to work in a lot of different environments. I've worked in very, very large companies, and I've worked in very, very small companies. And there's one thing that I found to be consistent in all of them, and it's that maximum absence of coercion choice remains. If you want to do something, you have that choice. Red Hat is arguably the largest, well, they are the largest open source software vendor inside of the United States. They are one of the largest software vendors in the world. $34 billion acquisition by IBM and they run the vast majority of their business entirely on Linux. When I say that, I don't mean, that doesn't mean that everybody in the entire office chooses to use a Linux desktop, but it does mean that everybody in the entire office has the choice to use a Linux desktop. And I have had numerous conversations with Red Hat employees where they've told me flat out, I needed this tool. That tool didn't exist on Linux, and so Red Hat retooled their workflow to accommodate a user using that tool. And that's a powerful message from Red Hat. But the other side of that spectrum is there are people say, well, I don't work for a $34 billion company. I work for Altaspeed Technologies, my IT consulting company. I got seven guys. Let me tell you, I haven't done the math, but I don't think we're near $34 billion. If IBM was to make an offer tomorrow, I wouldn't say I wouldn't accept it, but I don't think we're worth $34 billion. And we managed to do all of our work entirely on Linux. Now, in our case, we don't necessarily offer so much of a choice because if we have to support that stuff, it gets a little dicey. And so we basically tell people, here's your corporate laptop. It runs Linux. Get used to it. Um, Alan Hicks, who is very well known in this conference, and who's, I think he's here somewhere. I haven't seen him, but I'm sure he's coming. Um, He's what you would call an experienced Linux user. 
And there isn't anything that he's ever found as a limit. says, well, I, I can't get that thing done on Linux. I'm not able to do that with Linux because he's an experienced Linux user. Now, my, well, she's older than me, mother is what you would call a not very experienced Linux user. And she's still able to get all the things that she needs to be able to get done on Linux. And the point I'm trying to get to is this. It doesn't matter how big of a company you are, it doesn't matter how small of a company you are. It doesn't matter how experienced you are, it doesn't matter how inexperienced you are. One of the most fascinating, most awesome things about Linux is that it is welcoming and inclusive to everybody. And anybody can join that, partake in that operating system and, and play in that playground. And there are tons of people that are around to help you. And if you need help, just look around all the people that raise their hand. I hear the argument that Linux is not a religion, right? That's what I hear from, and, I, and I'll talk about this. And people will tell me, it's a tool. Don't you understand it's a tool? It's not a religion. It's not something you subscribe to. It's not something you believe in. And I, Scott McCarty, who works for Red Hat, I, I had an opportunity to interview him a couple of weeks ago. And uh, I asked him about that very thing. I said, as a person who, who grew up and, and, and didn't have access to the same technology that somebody that you know, maybe went to a school that Microsoft sponsored. And so any tools or things that you wanted to experience, you had to find a way to get them on your own. Did that shape you in any way? And, 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 and how do you view open source today? And his answer was, listen, man, if Linux is a religion, I'm a subscriber. I drank the Kool-Aid, I'm all in. You know? and, and you find that from a lot of people that are really passionate. A lot of people, that guy right there in the front row, uh, he has dedicated all of his online presence, that guy right there, same thing, all of his online presence to trying to go out and advocate on behalf of Linux users and try to get them involved and interested in this operating system. And after thinking about this for a long time, about the concept of do we treat it as a pragmatic tool or is it something more, I came to some realizations. First of all, it's not about the tool itself. If you think about this, think about somebody who builds a house. If I took a very talented construction worker, and maybe this construction worker or this architect or contractor, that person knows how to build the best houses that humanity has ever seen. And if you hired that contractor to come build your house, and he said, I would love to build your house, however, there's just one exception. For whatever reason, I usually use DeWalt tools. I find them to be very reliable. I find them to be very powerful. I find them to have, be made of precision quality and whatever it is that makes a tool a good tool. And he said, that tool isn't available, and so I'll have to build your dream house using tools that I purchased at Walmart and Black & Decker crappy ones. Does anybody think that you would get any less of a quality house because of the tools that that contractor is using? Or is the talent and the quality of the end product a result of the passion and, 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 and the experience of the builder, right? To me, I, I think that's a more accurate representation of Linux. It's not that Linux is a good tool or a bad tool per se. It's you have to choose as an individual what battles you want to pick. What battles do you want to fight? Because I'm not saying Linux is a perfect operating system. I'm certainly not saying you're never going to run into problems. But I am saying that you'll run into necessarily any more problems than you'd run into with Mac OS or Windows. They're just different problems. On Linux, yeah, you might struggle a little bit to get XYZ meeting application to work at your company. But on Windows, you're going to struggle to get the computer to boot sometimes to launch that application that's already installed. It's a matter of choosing which problems you want to solve. And what that eventually brought me to was this idea of trust. Trust is really in the center of what we look for in anything we evaluate. If we're evaluating a, a restaurant, if we're evaluating a hotel to stay in, when we're evaluating a house to buy, all of those things are evaluated from a perspective of trust. Do I trust that the house is built of good quality, is going to stand up for a long time? Do I trust that the restaurant serves safe food that's heated to an appropriate temperature, that tastes good, that's served with good service? We evaluate things on trust. And I think that there is simultaneously and paradoxically a weird lack of trust in, in, in those people that, that are skeptical of Linux. And I think there's an abundance of trust in those like me who are an advocate of Linux. And I think we have to find a way to balance those two things. What is it that makes people choose 
a given operating system. Now, there's an interesting little meme, and it says something to the effect of uh, the Microsoft, there's a, there's a little thing that says, could you rate Microsoft Windows, and would you recommend it to a friend? And then the meme goes on to say, I need to make you understand that people don't walk around having conversations recommending operating systems to each other. <laughs> now, now, that doesn't apply in this room, clearly, but it does apply to the vast majority of people. Your mother, your grandmother, your friends, your girlfriend, wife, whoever. That, this is just not a typical point of conversation. You don't sit around and talk about operating systems. So the way people choose an operating system is based on a couple things. First of all, what's available in the store, right? If System76 had computers at Best Buy in a nice little white, elegant table that was sectioned off and you had salespeople that walked around and said, this is the computer you should buy. I don't know anything about it, but I was told to tell you that this is the computer you should buy. They would sell more computers, right? Because it's the machine that's available and they can just purchase it. It's a far less appealing you know, metric to say, you go to Best Buy, pick out a computer, bring it home, take a flash drive, plug it in, well, plug it into a different computer first, run this in magical incantation code thing, then plug it in, and then push some random series of keys, I can't tell you which one, one of them will work, hopefully, sometimes, and then uh, you'll boot off the flash drive and then there'll be an installer and hopefully that works, and if everything goes right, you might get a black screen, if that happens, there's another ma magical incantation you can type, and then hopefully it'll boot, and maybe if all of that goes well, you might be back to where you started where the computer booted up to a desktop. And people look at that and go, say what? The <laughs> people use Windows because they're comfortable with it. People use Windows because their friends use Windows and their coworkers use Windows. And so when they go to a store and Windows 10 is available on this computer and they go, well, I know where all the things are in that and if I don't, I'll ask Bob because Bob knows. Right? There's a community infrastructure around that. There's a familiarity around that. There's software availability. Anybody that's run Linux for any more than five minutes has figured out that there are more applications available on Windows, even Mac OS, than there are on Windows. Now, maybe not in quantity, but as far as applications on a day-to-day -day that you're going to run into where somebody's going to say, do you have this thing installed, more of those are available on Windows. It's more socially acceptable. Before I started attending a lot of Linux conferences, I used to go to a lot of other non-Linux conferences. And I have run Linux on my laptop for as long as I've had laptops. And when I would go to present, or when I would go to, to, to talk to somebody or show somebody something, they would go, what's that? I said, oh, that's, you know, wobbly windows. That's what that is. Oh, that's cool, you know? But, but they, it wasn't socially accepted. They didn't, it, was, it was like you're running this weird thing. You're the odd man out. You're, you're, the coo you're the not cool kid that can't really afford or doesn't want to participate or you want to be the weird one out. And, and since then, I've kind of learned to own that. But running Linux on the desktop is not a socially acceptable thing to do in the mainstream IT community. And finally, there's complacency, right? At the end of the day, like I say, People don't go out of their way to experiment with operating systems unless they have a natural interest in experimenting with operating systems. It's, it's just not a pastime for most people. Then you look at the other side, and you look at the walled garden, also known as Mac OS. People, what you have to understand about people who buy Apple products, they're not purchasing a computer, they're not purchasing a phone, they're purchasing an experience, right? When they go into an Apple store, they believe, for better or for worse, that they are walking out with not only a computer, but they're walking out with a software infrastructure, a full-on ecosystem, a support infrastructure. You would, I, I have friends that have Apple computers. There's one guy. He is amazed that the Apple Care people gave him a new power supply for his laptop. And he tells the story as if God himself had cut bread and distributed it, you know, like, he's like, they gave me this $111 power supply. I'm like, the fact that it's $111 is part of the problem. And you bought a $4,000 laptop for the privilege of getting your crappy power supply that cost $111 and crapped out in the first year, and that's supposed to sell me on something? Come on. They bought an experience, and they believe that Apple Care, and again, for better or for worse, regardless if you have Apple Care or you don't, there's a belief that Apple Care is really going to take care of these people. They're your best friends, and they're going to make sure that you have a good experience. And if you don't, they're going to make it right. You're going to pay a premium for that, but they're going to make sure you have a good experience. Now, contrast that for a moment 
with how we as Linux users treat new users. Hey, my Wi-Fi doesn't work. Pfft, have you read the manual? Did you grab the man page? Because clearly this esoteric utility is in here and it tells you how to enter the SSID in a config file, you just save it and uplash. I don't know what the pro but when I click the little button to connect to the Wi-Fi, noob. You know, that that's the that's the that's the reaction that we give to these people that are coming in. And so then they look over there and go, well, I guess I could just spend some money and then everything works, right? And that's a problem because at the end of the day, we can rag on Mac OS, but it just kind of works, right? There's also consistency. Apple, I was just talking about this with Jim. Apple hasn't really changed their UI in 20 years, right? If I go boot up and uh, the, uh, you know, whatever power, whatever the appropriate hipster Apple thing was back in the early 90s, the, the, the Power Mac, the general UI layout of this little Apple in the corner, and you got, that's all basically what it is today. Yeah, there's a dock, and now we have Spotlight, but basically it's the same thing. And so if you were comfortable on a Mac 20 years ago, you're pretty comfortable on a Mac today. Still got the little Macintosh HD hard drive right on the desktop, right? Everything kind of looks the same, and Apple's really good about keeping that consistency to the point that you have, and I don't mean to pick on iPhone users, but you have iPhone users running around going, hey, check this out, we have swipey keyboards. That's so cool in 2019, that's awesome. You know, and the rest of us are sitting here like, really? <laughs> 10 years ago. <laughs> so uh, the, 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 the Apple infrastructure leaves a lot, or, or doesn't leave a lot to be desired. If you have a basic set of computing needs and you wanna get those done, and you know where we saw that really take off and you know where we really saw that hurt us? We saw that hurt us when you had this mass exodus of developers exiting Windows. And they decided that they were going to look for another platform. And you know what? A lot of those people started with the Linux desktop. They installed Linux on their laptop. They tried to get their work done. And then they were told RTFM one too many times. And so they started to look for something else. And a lot of those people wound up on Mac OS. And a lot of those people never left. Now, some of them did because some of them realized they wanted to put their hands on more levers than Apple would give them access to. But a lot of them said, you know what? It's got a crappy terminal, but it can be replaced. You know what? The hardware's really, really nice. And it lasts a really long time. And Apple Care makes sure that when my $120 power supply does go out, they just give me a new one. That kind of experience and, that, and Apple being willing to support in a very high level from people who needed the technology to get out of their way so that they could get their work done, I think that led or, or at least contributed a lot to Apple's early success in the, in the developer market. Now, you look at where we are today, and I've had a chance to be down at Dell. I've talked with Barton George and their Sputnik project with Dell, where essentially Dell is trying to target developers and saying, hey, that worked really well over there we can make that work on Linux. You want good, solid hardware, you're willing to pay for it, and you just want Linux, we're willing to support that, and we're willing to go out on limb. But let me tell you something, and this is not to rag on Barton George, he's a great guy, but you can tell Dell is hedging their bets, right, to a certain extent, because it's not the front page of Dell.com, it's on Barton George's blog when the new products come out. And so we have a, we have a problem still, I think, where you have developers that are looking for an exodus, and I still don't know that we're quite where we need to be to give them a soft landing spot. And that's something as we as a community, I think, can work on together. Because there are good reasons to use Linux on the desktop. Again, I've been using on Linux on the desktop as long as I've had laptops. So I've been there where your Wi-Fi didn't work, your sound didn't work, that did go to suspend, but at least it booted, and so that seemed like a small win. I've been there. And today, when I buy a computer, when I, this X1 Carbon, <laughs> I boot it into the UEFI interface. I couldn't get it to work. And I was like, man, for years and years and years, we made a lot of progress. And now all of a sudden, I buy a brand new X1 Carbon, 1700 bucks, and I can't boot Linux. That's weird. <laughs> and then I go into the UEFI, and it goes, you know, whatever, system configuration mode, Windows. I'm like, what's that? I click on it, Linux. All of a sudden, everything works. And Lenovo has incorporated a different standby mode. They've incorporated different little hotkeys on there. And all of that stuff is baked into the UEFI system right from Lenovo. And they don't even necessarily, they don't officially support Linux out of the box. I imagine the fact that Red Hat and Google that buy a bunch of these mach machines and put Linux on them probably contributed to that. But the point is, we've reached, we, we've reached an era now where hardware manufacturers are keenly aware of the fact that people are buying this kind of stuff and putting desktop Linux. It's becoming more socially accessible. 
I was at System76 a couple of years ago, and I had to, I do broadcasting, and so I, we were going to do a show from System76, and I do all of the shows on Linux. And so I, they said, would you do a show from here? I said, absolutely, I would just need a computer to run Linux on. So they said, okay. So they gave us one of their really beefy machines, and I sat down in it, and I started installing software that I would need to do the broadcast. And I said, oh, I, that's right, I need this, and I install it. Oh, I, that's right, I need that. Add the repo, do this. Okay. I get done, and I, it dawns on me, and it just hit me like a, like a freight train. That would never work on Windows. That would never work on Mac OS. I'd have to call 15 different companies, get 17 different serial keys, which I left at home or whatever, enter those in, try and get activation, reach some answering service, wait for them to call me back. Some of them actually have little hardware dongles. You've seen this. You plug it into the back to actually get the software to work. No way in heck I could get that, I could get a broadcast up and running in four hours on any other platform. But guess what? All of the tools are free and open source. All of them are available in the repos. And so all of them were downloaded to the computer in less than 15 minutes. You know what the better part is? Any one of you can come up here after this presentation. You can say, hey, I want to do what you're doing. And I can say, okay, it's in the repo. Download it, install it, use it, have fun. All of that stuff can be shareable. And that's an empowering thing to be, for you to be in the control of that software rather than some company. Because as a consultant, I worked for a, for a medical organization that bought a piece of software for $50,000. And they went, that's really good software for $50,000. We should buy 25 copies. And then the software manufacturer went out of business, and they couldn't activate it, and they lost lots of money, right? That can't happen with open source, because even if the software developer does something meh, you can fork the code, and you can continue. That level of software availability and that level of modularity to be able to just get what you want when you want it is something that fundamentally doesn't exist on another operating system. I like this X1 Carbon. Before I had this X1 Carbon, I had a Dell XPS, and I liked that a lot. And before I had the Dell XPS, I had an HP Elite Book. And before I had an HP, you know, I can go on and on and on. The point is, each one of those computers are made from a different manufacturer and have a wildly different feature set. And guess what? My operating system has stayed exactly the same from one to the other. Why? Because my operating system runs on everything. To include MacBooks and Windows Surface, whatchamajiggits, I can install Linux on anything. The last thing is native server tools. And this is a bit of a esoteric example. But my day job is a system administrator, so I spend a lot of time going into client infrastructure and, and working on stuff on their servers. And I, just the other day, I sent him a message, and I was working on a, on a very esoteric piece of equipment. And it said, to properly update the firmware, you'll need to download this program called Putty so that you can establish what we call a secure shell session. I went, oh, wait, I just push tilde, and then I can SSH in. Great, cool. That's the kind of f flexibility that you have as a system administrator when you spend half your day SSHing into switches and routers and moving stuff across networks and analyzing stuff like that. It becomes a major advantage as an administrator to have the same environment running on my laptop that's running inside of the data center. Guess where else that's true? Developers. Developers love being able to run code locally, and that's part of what has made containerization and the ability to move basically work environments from one to the other, or from one machine to another, rather. All of that comes because of developers. And so there, if you work in this industry, which I assume that a lot of you do, then running Linux on the desktop makes a lot of sense for you as well. But finally, I think it leads to a better end result for the user. If you take somebody who has no vested interest and no per perceived uh, you know, ideas of what something should be, I take my eight-year-old and my five-year-old as an example because they have no, they've never known anything else because that's the only thing that their computers run is Linux. And I remember when my son went to, to kindergarten and he comes home and he's like, Dad, you fix computers, right? I said, yeah. He goes, you should fix the school ones. They're slow. You know, and these are brand new Windows machines. And he's been at it for five seconds and he's figured out that those computers don't do what his laptop does. He pushes something, he expects it to happen right then. He clicks on something at school, it doesn't work. And his entire school has gone to web apps. They're all on G Suite. So guess what? His experience is fantastic because he just opens his little G Suite thing and does all of the creepy Google things that the school tells him to do on his laptop. And, and, it, and it, it, sh it exemplifies to me that I, this eight-year-old can figure this out, but I will go work with a four-year-old, and they're like, the print button's in the wrong place. I'm just, 
the print button is in the wrong place. I can't be expected to use this, right? We have these preconceived ideas of what something is supposed to be, what a piece of software is supposed to look like, and how something's supposed to work. If we can get past that, I think we're all in a better place. Here are some uncomfortable truths. Windows has, is the most targeted operating system for security vulnerabilities, and we see this time and time again. And I told you, I host a weekly talk radio show. We talk about open source and Linux-related software, and every time I bring that statistic up and say, Windows gets targeted far more than Linux, they say, well, that's because there are more Windows boxes out there. That may be true on the desktop. That is certainly not the case in the data center, certainly not the case for servers. The things that are connected to the, server, uh, the internet all the time, just so we're clear on that point. The software license, we talked about that a little bit. The, uh, the user experience, Microsoft, let me, let me back up. Being motivated by profit is not a bad thing, right? I like to eat, therefore I like to make money so that I can eat. That's a good thing. You want to make sure that your intentions and your goals are aligned with your users. And when you can do that, you stand to not just make money, you stand to make a lot of money, and you're gonna have very, very, very loyal customers. Proton Mail is probably the best example I can think of this. Do they charge for their service? Yes. Are people not only happy to pay it, but proud to pay for their Proton Mail subscription? Yes, absolutely yes. Why? Because they believe in the product that Proton Mail is putting out, and Proton Mail believes in the privacy of the user in which they are charging the money to protect. You have a choice. You either pay for your privacy, you either pay for the service with your privacy, or you pay with your wallet. And what Proton Mail has figured out is that more users are willing to pay for their wallet, with their wallet, if you give them the opportunity. And so finding a company or finding an operating system, finding a software vendor, however you want to categorize it, if you can find one that aligns with what you're trying to do, I, I th I, then, then I think you stand to, to, to succeed. But the, the issue with Microsoft is, I think they tend to elevate profits over what's actually in their user's best interest. And you notice that because Windows has basically gotten no attention for the past four or five years. Why? Because the users are concentrating on mobile. They tried to compete in that space. They weren't successful. So now what are they doing? Well, we'll go up to Azure and we'll just jump on that Linux bandwagon because Microsoft loves Linux. And so we're going to run everything on top of Linux and we're going to try to support that and we'll try and make a buck that way. To me, that's not a, I want to do what's in the best interest of my users. It's that's the shortest path to making a buck. And I, I don't know that that's where we, that's where we want to wind up as users. But when I think of, of a future, if we could get past all of the quote unquote shortcomings of Linux, and by the way, there are shortcomings of Linux, those can all be fixed because they're human problems. There's no technical reason why Adobe couldn't run Photoshop or Adobe Premiere or whatever else on top of Linux. It's a human nature problem, really. <coughs> they don't see the market in it, and so they don't do it. But there's nothing technically stopping them. The problem with competing operating systems are there are actual technical problems that keep those, those operating systems from ever being what Linux can be, I think, if we all stuck with it. So as an advocate of Linux, <coughs> what do we do about that? The first thing is what you're doing today, building community. Showing up to Linux tests and lugs, your local lug, and connecting with other people, and when people have questions, answering those questions and being available, helping people install stuff, that is one of the most fundamental, uh, greatest things that you can do to help with Linux advocacy, right? If people understand that they have a support infrastructure, if people understand that there's somebody there that they can ask a question to, especially if that person is approachable and not some curmudgeon that tells them to grab a man page every time they ask a question, that's how, you, that's how you build that perceived, I guess, the perception of a support infrastructure around it. Online content. That's, that's, that's what the, the Ask Noah show, my talk radio show, is all about. I spend an hour every week and go on the air and give people free advice about Linux. Whether they're getting started with Linux, whether they're running a business on Linux. If we took the amount of consulting hours <coughs> and built it at a normal rate, it it would be tremendous, right? And the reason that we give that stuff away and the reason that we come and set up a booth in the corner here and talk about it is to connect with people and to, to let people know that it's not always about money. Sometimes you have to give back. And it's fun to do that and to connect with people 
and then to, to help them move forward. And so whether you're contributing with online content because you have a YouTube channel, or maybe you've thought about starting a podcast, maybe you blog, maybe you just browse forums and answer questions or sit on IRC, all of those things are incredibly valuable. And, 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 and chat apps like Telegram or IRC or Matrix, those kinds of things give people access to instant, to su instant support, the same kind of support that they would get with something like an Apple Care or a Microsoft, whatever they call it. Finally, the most, one of the most underrated things that you can do is documentation. If you understand a project or a service, I can't tell you how many project leaders I talk to and I say, how can people help? And they go, we don't have enough people to write documentation. We have plenty of people donating. We have a million more devs than we know what to do with, but we don't have anybody writing good technical documentation. So if you are a writer or if you're a person that can take ideas and put them into human thoughts that human people can read and understand so it doesn't read like dev speak, that's a hugely valuable contribution that you can do. But what, is it, what does it take to be an effective advocate? Don't quote unquote talk people into Linux. It doesn't work. You cannot convince somebody that doesn't want to be convinced to do something they don't want to do. And that goes back to the very first slide. I don't believe in coercion. Somebody doesn't, if somebody believes that Windows is a better operating system for them or Mac OS, by all means, use it. I just won't tolerate the I can't use it, right? We'll talk about it and we'll figure out how you can use it, then you can choose not to if you choose not to. Your distro may not be the best distro for the person that you're talking to. I can't tell you how many people are really passionate about Arch <coughs> or Gentoo. Right? And while those are really great operating systems and they do a really great job at a lot of things and they're very tailored for advanced users that can kind of play around and it gives you more control over them, they're not always necessarily the best distribution for an end user. Now, I have a good friend. He puts all of his friends and family on a custom version of Arch that he maintains a repository for that all their computers are pointed to. He tests all of the packages and stuff like that and then pushes them out. If you want to go to that level of work, that more power to you, that's great. Just understand what you're getting into. But when people have a problem, the first thing they're going to do, unless you're going to give them your cell phone and be 24-7 computer support for that person, they're going to go online and they're going to Google, you know, can't do this in X. And if X isn't, I'll just say it, probably Ubuntu, chances are they're going to have a difficult time finding an answer. Now, that's not entirely true because obviously the, you know, obviously the ArchWiki has a bunch of workarounds to stuff, but they're oftentimes above the heads of most users. And so keep in mind what the support infrastructure for that user looks like before you, before you, you get there. I touched on this twice already. I'll, it's worth mentioning a third time. Please don't tell people to read the manual. It doesn't. There is nothing more frustrating when you're trying to get through a problem, when you're up against a clock or you're at work, and you can't move forward because this thing is in your way, and you went out on a limb and trusted some crazy person standing on a stage at a Linux fest that you should wipe your computer and install this thing, and now all of a sudden you can't get your work done. You go to that person and say, I need help, please help me, and that person says, read the 400 page manual, I'm sure the answer's in there somewhere, right? That's not a helpful solution. And I understand, I get it. As a guy who owns a IT consulting company where literally the bread and butter is people calling and asking us questions, I, I get how frustrating it is to answer the same question over and over again. I've been, I've been doing AltaSpeed for 10 years now, and I still, every week, get a call. My computer won't boot. Is there a flash drive plugged in? No, unplug a flash drive. There's no flash, look, there's a flash, there's no, oh, there's a flash, well, what would that have to do with booting the, unplug the flash drive? It works! <laughs> Imagine that. Once a week for 10 years, I've gotten that call, and uh, you know, it, yes, it gets old, and I understand the frustration. My suggestion, help the user through the problem first. Then you can tell them how they could have gone about getting that information themselves. But please don't tell people, go read the manual, go read this form post, here's a link. Give them the answer to the problem so they can get past the problem and then move on. And if that's not for you, then just be cautious about, pushing, about, about being an advocate, to be quite honest with you. <clears throat> be careful about going out there and telling people, hey, you should install this thing if you're not willing to stand by your user and, and help them through that thing. Leave it to the people that are willing to do that, that have the time to do that, that have the passion to do that. Understand your user's expectations before you ever even bring up the topic of Linux. So many times when I hear about somebody who had a bad experience of Linux, it's because they're trying to make it do something it wasn't 
intended to do. The very first thing I ask the user is, what do you do with your computer? I just want to know what you do with it. Because if your answer is, well, I, don't, I, just, I turn it on and I play this one single game all day long, and that one single game doesn't exist on Linux, probably a recipe for disaster, right? If your user, if you tell them that they run some esoteric proprietary piece of software that their company runs, and that's how they control some machine that, that does, you know, I don't know, stitching, laser cutting, whatever, and you look and you say, well, there's really no way that particular machine only has that particular software that runs on Windows, again, probably not a great time to wipe that guy's computer and put Windows on it, or Linux on it. And I see that happening, as dumb as that sounds, as I stand up here and say it, and half of you are going, well, obviously, it happens. Now there's ways around that, again, to those of you that are in the crowd going, I thought he said there was nothing, that it was always a choice, and that you couldn't, that you could always could run Linux, it's just, it's a choice. There's ways around it. We oftentimes will go into law offices, into medical offices, into manufacturing firms, and we'll take their existing Windows computers that run pieces of software that quite honestly just don't run on Linux, we virtualize those things, suck them up into a VM, run a Linux hypervisor, run Linux clients, and let them remote into those Linux VMs. Now the great thing about that is we've accomplished the same thing, whereas they can run that piece of software to control that thing, but guess what? Now we have snapshots and we can roll back. Now we have the ability to access that machine from multiple machines. Now we have the ability to back that machine up, the entire machine, not just a configuration, not just a piece of software, the whole kit and caboodle, software activation included, and suck that up and back it up somewhere. So their flexibility increases, their usability increases, oftentimes the speed increases because if you have a VM, especially if it's doing one task like that, you can set it up to essentially blow itself away every time it reboots so it always comes up fresh. Um, when you do something like that, you enhance the user's experience and they don't start to, they don't see Linux as a crutch or something that's holding them back. They see Linux as something that can help them move forward. And that all starts with understanding your user's expectations. Any questions? Yes. That, that's a great question. Yeah, it's a great question. So when you look at something like that, again, I, I look at what those users' needs are. So if she's 96 years old, I'm guessing she struggles a little bit with her eyesight. So big icons, big text, those are things that improve her experience. Now we all know that if you're browsing the internet and checking your email and stuff like that, obviously those are all tasks that Linux is perfectly capable of handling of natively. So if you were to install something like Zubuntu, right? And a, a very basic XFCE desktop that runs on top of a very well supported distribution, you then have the capability of making a giant Firefox launcher and a giant Thunderbird launcher and scaling the font way up. And I'll bet you, she looks at that and goes, oh, there's only four icons on the thing and I know what each one of those things do and I can see them all and I can read better. We've just improved her experience and we've done it using Linux. And now she doesn't have to worry about software activation. Now she has the ability, when you, when you get that, that machine tuned and dialed in exactly the way she wants it, and all of a sudden the hardware starts to die, guess what? Clone that hard drive out, write it to a new machine, and all of her stuff, it's like magic. All of her bookmarks are there, all of her files are there. Everything the way that she had that thing set up stays. That's just something you can't do with Windows or Mac OS. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, Windows 10, I mean, it's no exaggeration to say Windows 10 is, by all definitions, spyware, right? What it does and what it, the information that it takes and the information that it sends back to Microsoft is if it wasn't from Microsoft, if it wasn't from a publisher, we would say that computer is infected with spyware. I mean, that's what it is. Yes. I think it's a... I think it's a very big positive. The best distribution I can think of that does that well is Ubuntu Mate. Martin Wimper has specifically designed that operating system to be for new users, to be for his friends, his family, and his neighbors. And the way that he went about that is you have a basic Mate desktop, but inside of the control settings you can click, I want it to be like Mac OS, and all of a sudden you get a launcher, you know, a, a little dock down at the bottom, and everything kind of goes to Mac OS style, and the icons go to Mac OS style, and all that stuff. You click on Redmond, and it will structure it like a Windows 7 desktop. 
it, you can structure it as an old Linux uh, GNOME style desktop. You can structure it as the standard Mate. I, anything, I think there's even a, uh, is there's even a skin I think for um, the old Unity interface. And so you can have kind of a Unity style thing. And so that ability, one click to say, I want to go from this to this, absolutely, that's a great way to go. And again, it, in, mm -hmm. yep, and that's why, that's why Lindos is Lindos, right? Because people went into it with the expectation that it was going to function just like Windows, and then it didn't, and then they were disappointed. So that, I, I think that's a valid point, but, I personally, I have found, I'll tell you a little story. I went to do a, 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 a system recovery for a client. They had a Windows machine. They wanted a Windows machine. They wanted the recovery disk for the Windows machine. We called HP. They were sending out a replacement. This is back in the days where you had like little optical disks that you had to cycle through. They sent us the optical disk. It was going to take us four days. I said, I've got an idea. Take a flash drive. Put whatever it was on there. said, use this for a couple of days. At least you can check your email and stuff. When it comes in, we'll put Windows 7 back on there. 72 hours later, I show up with the disks that they paid for and said, hey, I'm here to put Windows 7. Don't you dare touch this thing. That thing runs faster and smoother and more alive. I haven't even restarted the darn thing since you've done that. I used to have to restart that Windows machine every night. Don't, don't touch it. Like, you paid 70 bucks for these. I don't care. Just take them. Take them. But uh, don't touch it. That's the kind of reaction that I've experienced from, from people that, that, that move over. And I think that while there is a... There is I think you're right. There is a uh, the temptation to say, well, I expect it to run like Windows because it worked like Windows. I also think there's a temptation to to further cement this idea that because we did it one way this time, that's the way it's going to be forever. And so while the rest of Linux continues to evolve and get better, you've got the people that are stuck on uh, on Mint, for example. They want that experience exactly the way it is to heck be with the consequences of what everybody else is doing. I think there's a danger there as well. Yeah, grandma using Linux. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. Sure. Sure. Let me, let me make a statement, see if you agree with it. The tools that you have found over years and years of using them to make your life easier don't exist on Linux. And so you look over, you look and you're like, I could do my job over there, but gosh, is it easier to do it over here. Is that kind of what you're saying? Uh, pretty much what I'm saying. I guess what I would tell you is I, I, I relate to that because that's the boat that I was in. I looked over and I went, I agree that's a superior technical thing. I like it. It's a good idea. I should totally do that. Now I got to go back to work. And then, you know, because I have to get stuff done, and this is where I get stuff done. What I found was when I actually dove in, I was like, it started with just a, I, I, I can't, really it started when we went from XP to Vista and then 7. I was like, I just, I can't do it. I can't, my mind can't make that switch. And so I, I started investigating other operating systems, and it was really a fluke. I, I picked up a, a cheap little 13-inch laptop, and I was just going to use Linux for one trip, one business trip. And... After not being around my Windows computer for a week and a half, I went, huh, I don't, I didn't actually, I then I just never got around to reloading my Windows partition back on there, and the, the, I, I sort of accidentally stumbled into it. But the, what I found was, to answer your question more directly, what I found was once I started using Linux to do the things that I wanted to do, I kept finding better ways to accomplish those things. And today what I would tell you is if I tried to go back to using Windows, I would be in the same boat you're in trying to go the other direction. 
I have no idea how to do the things in Windows that I can easily do in Linux because I've spent so much time doing those things in Linux. And so what I would, what I would tell you is that you will, I, I believe that you will, f you will begin to find the tools and the things that are out there. And some of them are pretty esoteric and some of them are hard to come by. But you, you'll begin to find those tools. Uh, to, to oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, you know, there's you know, there's a lot of truth there. So the, I, sw I, I recently, probably about a year ago, I switched from GNOME to KDE, and I did that because when when they went to Wayland, it was bad under X because what would happen is the shell would crash because it's all running over a single thread, and when that shell crashes in in X, it's not the end of the world. Like the screen kind of ping pongs, and then it comes back, and you just go back to work, and you're like, well, that was weird. Under Wayland, when that happens, the whole display server crashes, and you lose everything. And I was three hours into doing show prep for my radio show, and 45 minutes before I went on the air, Wayland just decided to crash, and I lost everything I was doing. And yeah, 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 save backup, blah. But the point is, I looked at it and went, hey, my computer in 20, whatever it was, 17, 18, should probably be able to not you should be able to edit a Word document without it crashing and just, you know, thought. So, so stuff like that, little stuff like that is stuff that no other operating system would tolerate, to your point. Mac OS would never tolerate that. Windows would never tolerate that. And users of those operating systems would never tolerate that. And for some reason, we make excuses about it on Linux. And we shouldn't do that. Um, again, uh, uh, to, to kind of circle back, I, I eventually what I found was, I mean, KDE is working really well for me. So I, I switched over to Plasma to solve that problem. Um, so I, I, I mean, we, we could talk afterwards and we could dig into like specific examples, but what I guess in general for as far as stability and stuff, yeah, it is kind of a trial and error thing. What I would also tell you is you're picking battles, right? You can choose to fight those battles of this thing has a weird thing. I could give you another example. No, when you click on the network thing, why doesn't it actually refresh the network thing? I, I know that the document says documentation says it's supposed to, and I've talked to plenty of developers that tell me network manager is doing that, but guess what? I was just upstairs, and when I click on the little network thing, I can't see all the Wi-Fi. And that doesn't happen on my phone, and it doesn't happen to other people's laptops. It just happens to me running Linux. So there are little paper cuts, if you will, that you, that you have to accept. I just look at that and I go, well, I would rather click the Wi-Fi refresh button three times or cycle airplane mode than have to deal with not having my software because it wasn't activated. And that's, or that I can't swap laptops because it, the, it's gonna blue screen if I don't have the exact same driver set. Yeah, sure. It's all you, buddy. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Right, it's that awesome. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, we're good at that, aren't we? Yeah, we make excuses a lot, yeah. Mm-hmm. To your wife's credit, though, she's right. In 2019, hide API should be a foregone conclusion. But, yeah, there we go. Yeah, I mean, it, should. it should. When you buy a laptop, it should work with high DPI. And I'd say the same applies for Windows and Linux. But you know what the difference between Windows users and Linux users are? Windows users aren't afraid to complain about it and make us think until it gets fixed. The problem with Linux users are, we, we the, those of us that are on the advocacy side make excuses for it, and those people that are not on the advocacy side just bail. Nobody files a bug ticket. Nobody actually works to solve the problem. We either complain about it or we bail, and or we make excuses for it. And I, I, 
those three things to me are are a huge problem. Like we need to acknowledge that problems exist so that we can fix them, but there is a process to fixing them. And oftentimes it requires time and energy to tell the developers, hey, that thing doesn't work. Here's what I found. How can we fix it? And what you'll find is most developers are thrilled to hear about problems if you're willing to report them and not just turn it into a, my laptop doesn't work, just fix it, you know? Because there's that, there's that sense of entitlement. Hey, I downloaded this free thing off the internet, now you fix it. And that's not, you know, that's not a healthy relationship either. Yes, of course. Yeah, we're great at it. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, I can agree with that. I can agree with that. I can agree with that. Yeah, sure. Sure. For Apple, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. Sure. Mm -hmm. Right. Right, and so and part of that comes down to the, the, the tools that are available, right? So Red Hat's money is not in Fedora, right? It's in RHEL. And so naturally, they spend a lot of money hiring people that do a really good job at extolling the virtues of RHEL over its competitors. And unsurprisingly, Red Hat makes more money than any other of its competitors, and there's a reason for that. I think you're right that we don't have, uh, that we don't have a company that's really doing that for the desktop. I'm not sure at this point there is enough money to justify that though. If you look at what the trends are, less and less people are using desktops and laptops. More and more people are using tablets and phones. And so if you're the executive of a company and you're looking at profit margins, you're going, well, all the users are going over to that thing over there. Why would we dump money in over into this thing over here? I don't think you can make that argument from a pragmatic financial standpoint. So what I do and what I would encourage you and anybody else to do is is, is lead that effort by community. I think that something like FreeNAS would have been laughed at if it, was, uh, if it had been 10 or 15 years earlier. And now, who do you know that goes out and buys uh, a, uh, I can't even think of what a, what a, what a go-to uh, snap in storage thing, snap was a, a thing. But, the, but the, you know, that's the thing. It's, yeah, sure, Synology, right? And uh, I think I was just having a conversation with a guy in the hallway, and we are joking about the, the, the pathetic hardware that's inside of those Synology boxes, right? And what you can do for half the cost if you install FreeNAS on a box. So uh, those community efforts have well exceeded their quote-unquote proprietary alternatives, and I think we got there not because we necessarily had a corporate backer or some company to come save us, but because we took the time to say, oh, that's my 3CX ringtone, by the way. This is not an iPhone, it's Android. Yeah. <laughs> just, so we're, just so we're clear as I'm standing up here ragging on Apple. But, the, uh, but yeah, the, uh, th that's what I would tell you. Is I, 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 think, uh, I think that we don't necessarily, I agree that there's no money to have a, a corporate backer. I don't know that we necessarily need it. My opinion, but. Sure. Yeah, I've got. I, I mean, I, here's the thing. Yeah, again, I, I, I've got four VMs, four Windows VMs that sit on that computer right there. Right. It's not possible to say that every piece of software will run on uh, on Linux. It's not. It, but I guess my point is that you can choose to run Linux, and there are ways to get around those problems. So, for example, the conference call solution. Right. If it were me, what I would have is just I'd have a VM that runs that conference call solution, un uh, unless unless yeah. Uh, unless the only thing you're doing is conference calls all day, right? And then, then there are other directions that we could go on and talk about. But, the, uh, but when you have that one piece of software, 
I don't buy that that's a, well, I have, to, I have to give Windows access to my metal and all of my data and everything I type and everything I search and everything I chat and everything, every call I do so that once a week or twice a week or once a day I can fire up this one piece of software. And then the other part of that is, and I, I understand that not everybody has control over this, but the other part of that is, let's face it, it's not like we don't have conferencing solutions on Linux, right? Uh, people may choose not to use them, but Zoom works really, really well. Red Hat Guy Blue Jeans works really, really well. Hangouts works <coughs> sometimes. Uh, we do. We we put we've 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 suggested dual booting. It, you, typically, what you find is in the in the interim phase, while you're going from a Windows environment into a Linux environment, you're almost shooting yourself in the foot not to recommend that user dual boot because, on one hand, there is the risk that they just fall back into well, I'll just click on the Windows thing every time the computer boots. The other side of that, though, is if you take them too far out of their comfort zone too fast, you, you, it's an exercise in frustration. It's not an exercise in showing them new and exciting tools. Um, if they can, if they, you have to give them a, a, an emergency get out of jail free card, I have to get something done and I know how to do it over here. When you can perfect the solution on the other side, then you can revisit the, well, let's just wipe the drive and, and you know, encrypt and all that stuff. And with that, I think I'm on, I'll take one more. That's an excellent point, and I see what you're talking about. I find it to be way more valuable to the community to continue to refer to those people in their accurate term of filthy dual booters. Even if they're not. For those of you that are not in on that joke, Michael has VMs and we call him a filthy dual booter, even though he's not a filthy dual booter. <laughs> <laughs>